Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Mr. Simonson. Uh, Mr. Simonson. Beverly Harris. Oh, I'm sorry. Beverly Harris. Yes, Chambers. <laughs> Simonson. Yes. Are you still in the building? We all go on mute. We are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Chester Upland School District's Return to Learn Community Forum. I am excited. I am Dr. Carol D. Burks, and I am the proud superintendent for Chester Upland School District, and I'm so happy that you are here with us this evening. Let's see who's here joining us. I'm sure we have some parents, so the parents could just put your, uh, acknowledge your, that you're in the room. From the chat, we have our, some faculty and staff, we have administration, we have community leaders. I wanna say welcome and thank you for being here this evening. This evening, the focus of our Return to Learn community forum is gonna be, a f we're gonna cover a few uh, matters this evening. One, I want to thank um, Dr. Bond. I want to thank our board members for joining us this evening. I want to thank all of our families, uh, of course, our faculty and staff. We are all facing an unprecedented time uh, in our nation's history, as well as for us locally. And together, we've been persevering and working very diligently to ensure that all of our learners are having or receiving a quality education. You know, I mentioned at the, our last receivers meeting that I have 2,169 reasons why I come to work every day. I have 2,169 reasons why I stay up to 1 a.m. I have 2,169 reasons why I do what I do, and I'm just so honored and grateful to have the opportunity to serve this community. Such a very enriching community, very talented individuals who live and work within our district. And again, together, I know that we can continue to work collaboratively
for the benefit of all of our learners. Our presentation this evening, we are we're going to talk a little bit about our foundation and who we are as an organization. Our mission, our we're going to talk about who we are as an organization. So our mission is that we're a school district that's committed to providing all students the opportunity to achieve excellence in the four A's, academics, athletics, the arts, and activities. The vision of the district is for every student to graduate from high school ready for college and or career in spite any and all challenges. We built our foundation also after, as I entered the district and we're focusing on what we call the core. And we've asked our collective community to rally around, you know, our mission and our vision, but also what grounds us. One, our C stands for children first. We want to make sure that we create culture, a culture of continuous learning for all of our students and our faculty and staff. One Chester Upland School District. We are one community dedicated to our, our partners, our parents, our students, our staff. We are also reimagining our district. Throughout, through continuous improvement, we will apply our four important levers for change, collaboration, capacity building, and deepening our knowledge. E is equity, equity, excellence, and emotional intelligence for all. Just want to share with you our purpose for tonight. One is to inform the community on our current protocols that we have established for our reopening for in-person learning. Two, is to discuss our phased reopening plan. And three, to provide overall communication to our learning community. So that will be our focus for this evening. Additionally, let's talk about our phases. Today, we were so excited to welcome uh, some of our low incident students who are in our role in our special education programming for their first day. It was so exciting. We had balloons, we had staff, we had the students, we had families. It was amazing to see the smiles on our, on our students' faces. And they had not been in school since they had not been to school since March. You know, there are a lot of studies that suggest that in-person learning not only has academic benefits, but it also has social emotional benefits for students and their teachers. And that social emotional learning is so important and the in-person learning um, is so important because also that's where students are, um, gets their, get their uh, socialization and they build relationships. And, and there's a researcher called Dr. James Comer. And he said, there's no significant learning that takes place unless there's a relationship. And it's all about relationships, relationships and relationships. So we are so excited that we're beginning to have our students uh, build some, some, a small population of our students today, got to build some relationships with some new friends and new teachers um, that they not had, did not have previously. And we're just so excited. Phase two, February 8th, and that's pre-K to two students. And then phase three, uh, February 16th for our th uh, third grade to 12th grade students. So those are our three phases of our school reopening uh, plan to date. So who, who's doing all this work and helping to reopen our schools? Well, we have a school reopening task force that's comprised of our school district's administrators, staff, teachers, community, and health professionals. And this is a plug there. We, we uh, need to secure at least two parents on that particular task force. We had someone and that person could not make it consistently. Um, so we would love to have a two or three parent volunteers. So I will, when I meet with my uh, school, my uh, superintendent's parent advisory council tomorrow, or if you are interested, you should uh, email Mr. William Patterson, who is our family liaison, if you're interested on, in serving on our school reopening task force. And he can be uh, contacted at W. Patterson at chesteruplandsd.org. We also have a health and safety team. And this particular team, their core work is to monitor our COVID-19 cases, to inform our community, to 
make sure that we have the proper guidance in place and follow all the health and medical protocols. And you see those are the individuals who are part of that core team. So we administered a survey to our families, our faculty and staff, as well as to our students. And so tonight I'm going to share with you our survey results, and then we will continue on with the presentation. So the, our school reopening committee uh, administered a survey on January 4th. The window was from January 4th to January 24th. And there were 1,375 responses to that survey. So I want to please give yourselves a round of applause because that's almost, well, 50% of our families who completed the survey. So talk about something being significantly significant. Those are significant numbers. So give yourselves a round of applause. We appreciate you. We should see in the chat, like, yes, Ra, us, we did it. Okay, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Additionally, we, we're gonna get into the survey results now. So of the 1,375 students, um, we have an active enrollment, as I said, uh, I guess the data I got today was 2,635, it was 2,639 last week. So our active enrollment of 52.2%. So thank you of you took the survey. If you can see here, you see that the students, over 273 families took the survey at Kuza, Main Street, you see 261, Stetzer, 121, Toby, 172, STEM, 263, and Chester High School, 285. So thank you. Further survey results. If you see, it's broken down by grade level. In my presentation, I will share, as I always do, um, throughout it, on our website, under the superintendent's page, as well as if we can get it up on Facebook, we also will share it there. So if you look at those numbers by grade level. Additional results. If you, we asked families the options that they wanted within our survey. One, whether you preferred a hybrid learning model, full remote or digital. And so 61.62% opted for hybrid. And so, and you see full-time 36.55% wanted everyone to come in every single day, a regular school day and 1.83% of our families uh, selected the digital model. And so we're gonna talk later on in this presentation at about 645, we're going to present a comprehensive overview of our, our digital program in which it has a design thinking approach that we're taking. So we reimagined our digital academy with a design thinking approach. And there will be a presentation a little later to talk about what that looks like and what that means. Additional further results from you. We, we broke down families' responses based on grade level. And if you see here, families from grades three to five said they wanted 58.96% of you said that you wanted your children to learn in a hybrid model. 36.06% said remote. And then 2.99% selected the digital option in which the digital option right now is only offered to families from sixth grade to 12th grade. We look at sixth to eighth grade responses. 56.94% selected hybrid, 8.61% digital, and 34.45% of the families selected remote. It's going on up to high school. So families from nine to 12th grade selected 54.1% hybrid, 37.6% remote and 8.16% hybrid. Further, what we saw within the survey based on the data that was presented that the majority, more than 50% on average selected the hybrid learning was preferred by our families. So we thank you for giving us that feedback, which is also 
uh, the direction we know that work, would work best for our learning community. And elementary parents were the most responsive in the overall survey. So come on, high school parents, when we serve you next time, we'd like for you to also to um, participate a little bit more. But we want to thank all of you in all seriousness. We want to thank all of you for your feedback and input. So as we prepare for school reopening, just going to talk a little bit about what we've purchased and what we will have prepared for you, as well as all of our learners, adult learners, as well as, of course, most importantly, our children. We purchased uh, isolation gowns and cots and masks and face shields and wipes, sanitizing, uh, um, flex wipes, disinfectant sprays, N95 masks. We have plexiglass barriers and sneeze guards in our classrooms. So each teacher has a plexiglass shield on her desk or his or her desk, uh, similar to what if you would go to a CVS or a local store. And our children also have plexiglass barriers that are trifold on their desk as well. Also, we'll talk a little bit about some decision-making guidance that we've made thus far. So we are creating, and actually we're in the final stages of our guidance document, which will have every single question, we hope, that you have as to what approaches and protocols that we will use in order to keep all of us safe. So that document is forthcoming, but we also uh, have established COVID-19 email addresses for all schools in the district. So if families want to have questions, you can email your schools uh, to your, COVID, your school's COVID-19 email address. We are also have guidance around visitors. So we're asking that you contact the school and make an appointment so that we can monitor and manage people coming inside of the book uh, of, the, of our schools as well as our administrative offices. We have a decision-making flowchart in which how we make decisions as to whether we send out a letter or who do we inform or do we clean or clean because of a situation that happened or do we close schools or open schools. We also have automatic temperature check stations in district. So if you come in our, our district now, if you visit schools and in our children also and all the adults when they enter our schools and our administrative office, it's, it's kind of actually kind of really cool. And I'm sure you may have seen it um, when you go into other uh, buildings or offices, which you stand in front of the automated temperature check machine and it automatically checks your temperature. And we have our staff there that's recording the temperatures as well as you check if you are exhibiting symptoms. Families were asking if your children are not feeling well that you do keep them home and we'll get into the flow chart a little later again Everything that I'm saying, this presentation will be provided to you. So, and you'll have it available to you. We have hand sanitizing stations throughout the district as well um, within our administrative offices, as well as uh, within the schools. We have a tracker in which we are tracking our COVID-19 cases. We have masking um, protocols in place and everyone is to wear a mask at all times. So if our children, all the adults, you have to wear masks every day, all the time, even if you're engaged in athletics. And the only time that our children, as well as our faculty and staff can remove their mask is if they are eating. We are only eating in classrooms, so we will not be utilizing our cafeterias uh, during um, this time period. Uh, we also have tr uh, protocols around transportation. So you will receive this information, what happens when my child gets on the bus, how my child and how the bus company, we partner with our provider. We will have guidance documents again for you, how we're cleaning our facilities, what happens on the playground. Uh, we've distributed a lot of uh, personal protective equipment throughout the district at every school. And then we are now in conversations with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to possibly offer by next now testing as a pilot. So as a pilot study. So what do we, what kind of, we also, as it relates to decision-making, we have other guidance. We've had um, timelines and accomplishments within our departments. We are, we looked at our hybrid learning model in which that looks like. So we'll be detailed for teachers as to when students should be on asynchronous instruction and you'll have that information when they should be receiving instruction um, 
teacher delivering instruction, our, how our schools and counselors should be advising. We are working on our whole child engagement. So we've hired additional uh, support staff, behavior technicians and social workers to support our schools. And we've worked on space planning. Our students are to be in our classroom six feet apart. We are adhering to that six, six feet apart rule. I know you may have heard on the news, three feet is okay, four feet, but in our district, we're holding fast to the six feet rule. And that is, uh, we are being supported with that by the Chester County Health Department. <coughs> Further, we also have up many other decision-making guidance. Like so all these things, I know they're small, but we have guidance around what happens in the auditorium, what happens in conference rooms and offices, moving right along. We also have guidance documents around our, how we gather in, in schools entering buildings, exiting buildings, ventilation. Again, all these things will be in a booklet binder bound electronically for each of you. So we'll send it electronically so each of you will have it. So you're aware of all the resources and, and protocols we should follow. We also have cleaning protocols and each of our custodians will have, well, let's go back. So we'll, we're instructing all members of our learning community to wash our hands, uh, of course, with soap and water for 20 seconds or more. We will also have, um, make sure we're installing various uh, automated uh, hand um, sanitizing machines as well as soap machines. We also will make sure that we have everything separated so that people can stay safe and use their own equipment. So in schools previously, you know, everyone would go into the jar and pick out, you know, a pen or a crayon, but each child will have their own separate uh, crayon box or resources so that people, we are keeping people safe. Further, so we also administered survey results to our staff and those results were administered on the 7th through the 22nd. And we received 296 responses to that survey. They provided us with feedback as to what their themes were. And if you can see here, we, and someone, I know we had some challenges with water. And so I talked with our facilities team and they said that uh, a plumber was coming in today. So when tomorrow I will check in with each school to make sure that they have hot water. So thank you for the person in the chat. Moving right along. We have further guidance I said about cleaning. We will continue on to our guidance documents around a flow chart. Each custodian will receive and has received a checklist. And that particular checklist includes, they have to initial their names in the areas of the facilities in which they cleaned on an ongoing basis. And so just so I can explain to the community, if you looked, if you say the gym and the kitchen, the library and all those areas, the types of time of day in which people are cleaning, they have to initial. And on Wednesdays, we, everyone with the exception of our essential workers will be at home and we will sanitize and do deep cleaning on Wednesdays. So all students and all faculty will work uh, virtually and our essential workers, meaning administration and support staff and others who fall in an essential, our nurses, they will work in districts. So we're preparing and making sure that everything is ready for us the next day. So we want to make sure you know that we're making decisions based on guidance from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, from the Health Department, the Children's Hospital of, Phil of Philadelphia. And so here's the guidance that we are advising. So if someone presents, for example, high-risk symptoms, 
Anyone who has a, a fever or temperature greater than 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit will consider it high risk and have these particular symptoms. They're categorized and we will make sure that the person before they enter our district will not be allowed inside the district if they're presenting with any of these symptoms. So for our, we've shared this with our administrators and we're going tomorrow, we have a town hall with teachers. We've also explained this to our teachers or our faculty and staff. And so any of these particular uh, symptoms that are exhibited, we will follow the, the appropriate protocol. We have additional, we have a flow chart, a decision-making flow chart. And so uh, for students, as well as for faculty, which is very similar. And so, uh, and we'll get into some of those details later where I'm gonna have Dr. Chambers just give a high leverage overview of the decision-making as to what happens if there's a case that occurs or if we have a possible case. We also have decision-making flow chart for faculty and staff that's similar. And again, later on, Dr. Chambers is gonna come and talk about from a high level, what happens in these scenarios. Here's the tracker that I mentioned on our website. So we have to get our December uh, results up there. And so as to what cases that we have, and we will do that um, by tomorrow. And so we have tracked for you by school or by building the number of cases that have occurred. And so we will have this updated for you. Further, we've, we've been um, communicating lots of information that's been taking place throughout the county, making people available of new guidance from Chester County Health Department. The Chester, um, the Delaware County COVID-19 call center has just been launched on Monday. So we're so excited about that because we work very closely with Chester County Health Department. So we send out lots of information throughout the district and we put items on our website as well as via Facebook and Instagram. So please continue to check because every day that I receive new information or we receive new information, we will share it with you. Additionally, the call center number for the Delaware County uh, call center and which is, this is a, it's a big accomplishment. So we're very happy that this has happened because as we are aware that we don't have our own health department within the Delaware County. So in response to all of the cases that have been occurring and where we are in the world, a call center was established. And there's a number there for you. We've put together a communications plan. And as I've, I've shared with you in the beginning of the conversation is that each school has an email address. So if you have questions about uh, reporting your child's absence, or if you think your child, and, this, and these email addresses are, if, are designed, if you think your child may have a possible case, or you have questions about COVID-19, or you should send them to your school's COVID-19 email address. If you see there is the school, COVID-19 at chesterupplandsd.org. I'm gonna ask Dr. Chambers, and we're gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna ask Dr. Chambers to come and talk a little bit about the decision-making protocol that I showed you in the PowerPoint uh, presentation, which I think is very important because it affects all of us and, is, and, and families and a community. We really need your support now more than ever. The protocols that we put into place are paramount, I'm sorry, Dr. Chambers, are paramount that we follow them. We cannot adhere from them. They've been research-based, they've been proven by, and scientifically research-based and schools and school districts that follow these protocols, they've been successful. Now, I'm not gonna say that they've not had any cases of COVID-19, but we were, they were able to minimize the spread and to minimize the number of people who received COVID-19, but we have to follow the protocols. And I wanna disbunk um, and dispel the misconception about every time someone um, may possibly uh, have COVID-19 or if someone they know their cousin's brother, sister might have it so far removed, they, we have to make sure that we follow the protocol. The protocol is not to close down everything. 
So that's why we're giving you all the guidance documents so that we can read it as a collective community so that we are all informed as to what the protocols are and how we are gonna jointly make sure that we keep everyone safe within our, commu our learning community. Dr. Chambers. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to open up with just sharing um, or reminding us all of what are some of the high risk symptoms and low risk symptoms as it pertains to COVID-19. Um, things that you need to be aware of um, prior to even sending your children back to school because parents should be assessing the students before they enter the building. High risk symptoms fever temperature greater than or equal to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit, a new cough, shortness of breathing, or a loss of sense or taste uh, or smell. So these are identified as group A. If there is anyone who has one or more symptoms within group A, they should not report to school. Group B, are more of the low risk symptoms consisting of sore throat, nasal congestion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle aches, fatigue, and headache. If any of our students have two or more symptoms following the group B list, then they would not be reporting into school. So that's key as you are assessing your students prior to allowing them to come to the building. As it pertains to the decision-making guidance that Dr. Burks spoke of just a few moments ago, at high level, we have um, identified, and again, this is based off of guidance that is offered by um, health departments and the CDC. We have a decision-making guidance for students who have reported COVID-19 symptoms during the day Students who have tested positive for COVID-19 with or without symptoms. Students or parent, if a student or parent reports that someone in the household has been exposed to someone who tested positive with COVID-19. Student or parent reports that someone in the household has tested positive for COVID-19. And then the last scenario is someone has close contact with someone during the infectious period with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. So these are, again, the five different scenarios that we utilize with making decisions on how we will address the needs of our students who fall under any of these categories. Very similar to the students, we have decision-making guidances for our faculty and staff, follows the same exact um, five scenarios it may look a little different from students. Obviously, um, one of the um, components of the decision-making is relative to parents needing to come to the school to pick their child up if any of these symptoms were to develop while they're in school versus a staff member, obviously, who can take themselves home. So as Dr. Burks mentioned, we will have a booklet that will spell out and you'll be able to visually see um, this protocol and the guidance for how we make decisions on who will need to, how we would need to address students, faculty, and staff with regards to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. There's some questions in the chat, and so I want us to address them, to have the appropriate staff member address them. So I will read them. Uh, one teacher asks, very proud teacher at Chester High School, woo, woo, woo. Just wondering if the survey responses can be broken down to percentages by schools for us. Absolutely, we will do that tomorrow um, in the town hall for teachers. So, and I wanna thank, uh, give him a, a nice acknowledgement. I wanna thank Mr. Ray Thompson for his support with doing that. A proud member of the Chester High School team. So thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, there is someone who said they just got notification through email that the, uh, town, that the community forum was taking place. Well, we've, we've had the announcement on our Facebook page for more than a week now, as well as on our other social media and Instagram, I believe, but it was definitely on the Facebook, our Facebook page. It was put on our website yesterday. So we just want this particular forum was really designed for 
the community and we have a town hall tomorrow. So I apologize you didn't receive it last week, but we did start announcing last week. Uh, additionally, we, another parent asked about uh, Ms. Beaver, have the district, has, has the district hired maintenance to clean as stated in the health and safety plan? Uh, I'll have Dr. Flannery address that question. Yes, the answer to the question is um, yes. So in addition to the, the Coatesville, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Chester Upland um, custodial staff cleaning the buildings, we do have a, a, a cleaning company who's been working uh, this week, uh, service master to, uh, to assist, um, with cleaning the buildings. So they'll be doing that all five days of this week. So thank you, Dr. Flannery. I was told this is from Ms. Beaver that the low incident kids that started today were not wearing masks. So how are you protecting others if they don't wear them? I want to have Dr. Marin talk about our low incident students and what she observed today in the classrooms and to address that. Dr. Mayor. Sure, good evening, everyone. So in terms of our low incidence um, population returning, we, we do recognize that these are our students um, that have significant disabilities. And so there may be um, you know, some of our students that have difficulty um, keeping their masks on, uh, but the teachers, uh, it, and I've observed it myself today, we're very diligent with, um, with prompting the students to, to keep their masks on. Um, from my own encounters, I did not see students that didn't have masks on. But as, as per the CDC guidelines, there are other measures that the staff uh, members can take in addition um, to just ha having a student wear a mask. They also ensure that they are properly uh, supported with their own mask. We provided face shields um, and we have hand sanitizer on site that can, be, um, that can be used regularly. So we do recognize that we have students with disabilities back, but we are working with them um, you know, as, and, and teaching them, um, you know, a new behavior for them, potentially if they spent most of their time in the home. And that is uh, practicing wearing the masks and having it on for a period of time. And then hopefully over time, extending the amount of time that they're able to, to maintain with the mask on. Thank you, Dr. Marin. There is a question about staffing in our, our special education um, classrooms. And so this question is from Ms. Beaver. There are multiple special education teachers uh, pos positions open. Who's teaching the classes? Uh, Dr. Chambers will address that question. Yes, absolutely. Um, currently we are fully staffed for the students that are in the buildings um, as of today. Um, we are still continuously recruiting heavily in multiple areas, including and especially um, special education um, so that we have a full complement of staff by the time all of our students return uh, in person and district. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Chambers. Uh, this question is from Ms. Forney. I see deep cleaning on Wednesdays after being in the building for two days. Why is there no deep cleaning schedule after the two days following? In short, why is there no deep cleaning days on Saturday? So uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Flannery, do you want to address that question? And then I'll also support you with it because I just want to stay in my, um, in my lane <laughs> because we have a team. Right. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, um, I think some of the equipment that we've, that we've purchased for the custodial staff, some of the, um, you can call them misters, they're like sprayers uh, for the sanitizing, you know, that, that can sanitize classrooms in a short amount of time. So uh, those types of devices are things that we've purchased, um, you know, can be used at the end of any school day or even during the during a school day, but that will help at the end of a, at the end of the day or at the, at the end of Fridays to help with some of the, uh, the sanitizing that needs to, that needs to go on. Thank you, Dr. Flaherty. Uh, this question is from, well, there's an acknowledgement from Mr. Thompson. So Chester High, Rob, Mr. Thompson. So thank you. Uh, this is from Ms. Olson. We were in the building today and there were no trifolds on teacher or student desks. Will we actually be getting them? So I'll let Dr. Flannery answer that question. Trifolds, <clears throat> trifolds and um, plexiglass, all the PPEs, all the different types of supplies were all delivered to every school um, by Thursday afternoon of last week. So, I mean, they, those trifolds are in the buildings. 
So every school, thank you, Dr. Larry, every school has trifles. We have, we ordered thousands of them as well as the plexiglass. So uh, if your school does not have those up, we'll make sure I put a note out to principal because uh, they are in the process of putting, uh, having them installed. Our focus was to put them in the low incidence classrooms first. And so if that did not happen at your school, I will, uh, I'm gonna have talk with the principals. And so um, our school level administration and our and our our custodial staff, but each school we have plenty. So each school will be set up before people as we phase in our school opening, reopening. Okay. I want to make sure I cover all the questions. Um, someone doesn't go on Facebook every day. Okay, so if I could just say, we will communicate via Facebook, Instagram, as well as our website. We are in the process of working with the vendor to revamp our website. And so people have told us very difficult to find things on our website. That's why we've gone to Facebook and Instagram. So if you could please check it regularly because you will receive updates. You will receive updates, letters from me. And that's the vehicle that we found to be very helpful. So please check all avenues. Also, we put a class tag is also an avenue that we use with our principals. So many of the correspondences that I disseminate I ask that our teach our uh, excuse me our administration send it out via class tag to families as well as share with teachers. So in every way that we can, we will communicate. But thank you for sharing that. Just want to make sure that I covered everything. So we will have thank you. This someone asked, will the deep cleaning um, with the company be the same products during the week? So we have requested all the the uh, disinfectants and all the cleaning protocols, as well as all resources that the company is using. And we will have available to you everything that's being utilized. And Dr. Flannery was given that, that assignment. <laughs> so I don't know if you have any updates, Dr. Flannery, that you would like to add. Well, no, I think you kind of covered it that we will have, they're called safety data sheets or safety data sheets that you know, anytime you're using a chemical in a, in a school or hospitals or those types of things, that those things need to be on file. I mean, just for the safety of people, you want them to clean, but you also want people to be safe. So like you said, we, we, um, we will compile that, be it, you know, stuff that Chester Upland people are using or any sort of outside group, um, you know, to make them available. And again, to make sure everybody's safe. Thank you, Dr. Flannery. So in our guidance document, we'll have all the cleaning protocols, as I mentioned, all the disinfectants, everything that we're utilizing for every aspect um, of the district. And if there's something, once we get the documents out, I believe in continuous learning and continuous improvement. So if there's an area that we did not cover, um, we want you to tell us if you have questions and we would really appreciate it because it's about our collective strengths and collective talents so that all of us will be successful. We are happy that um, Mr. Newton will play a key role in making sure that all the cleaning and disinfecting is happening. And he and Dr. Bond are gonna take an active role in this as well. So we look forward to, to uh, sharing all that information with you. And as I've mentioned, I've tried to be very, um, since my tenure here, very transparent about things that I'm sending internally and externally and sharing with everyone. So I will share or we will share I said, if there's some things that you think we didn't cover, we're welcome to hear what they are once you get this, receive this guidance document. I want to make sure I honored everyone's question. Someone asked, is this being aired live via the district's Facebook page? Unfortunately, this evening it is not, but I've asked my team to find out how we can um, put this on Facebook tomorrow. So they, I believe they said we can get that done. Uh, there's another channel to reach out to the community. Many parents are not comfortable using Zoom. Also, these meetings should be recorded. Okay, it's listed, it, we're recording today, so thank you. Listed as references for viewers at people's leisure if they are unable to attend. The district also has an Instagram page, an Instagram owned by Facebook and has a live feature. So thank you, Miss Forney, very much. And we are aware, and I won't 
make excuses or give blame because I don't like to do that, but we we should be uh, airing this Facebook and unfortunately we're not this evening, but it's duly noted, we will make sure we do that in the future, but this will be uh, shared on Facebook at a later date. So thank you, Ms. Forney. What about those of us who chose full virtual? So if you selected virtual, your, your child's teacher, we purchased cameras and microphones to go on every Promethean board within district. So that, and we are providing professional learning for our teachers. So they know how to do that. Our, you know, teachers, most teachers, including myself, we were not taught to teach, you know, uh, virtually and some kids in the classroom and some kids at home. And so we are providing professional learning and we've enlisted the support of a vendor to support us and to make sure that our teachers are equipped with the skills that they need and that they feel comfortable teaching from the classroom and engaging children who are at home. So that's a lot for a teacher. And I want to give a round of applause for the teachers before I even move forward, because, you know, the teachers, we just, we just admire you and your resilience and the work that you're doing to make sure that our kids are learning. And we know that we're stretching you and asking you to do some things that you haven't done before, but we just want to commend you. And we, we commend you for being nimble and flexible and resilient. Let's please give a round of applause for teachers. Yay for the teachers. Think about it, you know, all of us are because of the teachers. So we are so excited for the teachers. Thank you. I hope I answered your question, Ms. Jones. Are you going to be questioning whether students and faculty are taking any medications that can lower temperature, Tylenol, ibuprofen prior to coming to school? I'm gonna let Dr. Chambers after I finish this um, to answer this question or whether they have a household member who has tested positive. I know that the question is not currently on the faculty screening form. So the question, Dr. Chambers, is are you going to be questioning whether students and faculty are taking any medications that can lower temperatures, Tylenol, ibuprofen, prior to coming to school? That's one part of the question. Um, we're, we're not mandating. Again, the, the expectation is that parents um, do this, complete the assessment of their, their children, as I mentioned earlier, with regards to what has been identified as high risk and low risk COVID-19 symptoms. As such, you should um, communicate with your child's doctor for uh, more specific information around that, um, and the doctor will provide appropriate care and um, guide you from that point. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chambers. And I know that the question is, okay, the other part of the question is, are we, uh, if, are we questioning whether a household member has been tested positively on the form, similar? Okay. Yeah, so as mentioned uh, previously with regards to our decision-making protocol, that is one of the five scenarios um, if a parent or a student reports that someone within their ho household has tested positive for COVID-19, we have a process in place for how we will address those matters. So again, that information will be provided to you with all of our other COVID-19 protocols. Okay. So about the N95 mask, at my job, we have to get fitted. What about the staff? So we do not, we, we've purchased a regular masks. We've, we also have cloth masks as well as N95 masks. And we have face shields. We are not fitting people. We have purchased the recommended masks face coverings that have been recommended by the CDC, as well as the Chester County Health Department. And, and, and we're following the protocols as it relates to face coverings. So we know we are not having people fitted for masks. We're following the protocols. These were recommended. What we've purchased has been recommended by the Chester County Health Department, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, as well as the uh, Center for Disease Control. And weekly, I participate in a meeting with medical experts 
along with other superintendents throughout our county so that we can stay current. And that's the information as to what are the best practices to ensure safe, safety or to help mitigate risk or, or and the spread of COVID-19. And as I mentioned previously, it is paramount that you have your child wear their face mask at all times in school. Of course, at home when it's appropriate and you know when that is, but especially at school. And so we've allowed, I know families have selected their learning model. And I wanna make sure that we're clear collectively as a community, the selection that you've made. So if you've selected that your child is going to attend school virtually, we're asking you to hold that selection through the third marking period. Because what we're doing is we can only, we have to social distance and have a certain amount of students in classrooms at a time. And we want to make that number no more than 10 total people in a classroom. And so if you've selected virtual, that means for the third market period, you have to be fully virtual. If you selected hybrid, you have to select hybrid for the third market period. Now, if you wanted to, we will survey you before market period four begins. And if you want to select another option, we welcome it. But in order for us to make sure that our students are safe and, and we keep, uh, we mitigate the spread, we want to keep cohorts together. And I'm gonna ask Ms. Yarbrae to talk a little bit about attendance and why this is so important. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that when you're on the um, remote work um, school environment, you actually have um, options to do your asynchronous and your synchronous work. When we're on the hybrid schedule, you're going to be in person two days a week, and then you're going to have your day off, and then the other group is going to have their two days on. So it's very important that we do this because attendance will be looked at a little bit differently. Because when the students are in person, they're not going to have the asynchronous model that they would in, in the um, remote learning. And so there'll be different um, items and selections from the teachers for, as far as their attendance and projects and thus forth. So at this point, we really would like you to stick to that model and make sure. And again, of course, when you were looking at the different modes where students are coming in and they're sick and are having symptoms, those students' absences will be excused. So it won't be a truancy issue. Those will be excused absences. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is clear on that. It's vitally important that when you, if you, if the school contacts you and says that your child may have been, is not well, be it if, say, if it's not even related to uh, COVID-19, it's gonna be really important that you are responsive so that you, I know you work, you're busy, but if you could please make sure that you update all your emergency contacts if you're not available. So we've asked the principals to do a mask to call and appeal to you. And if you could assist us in making this appeal throughout our entire community, we know that things change, you move or you change your phone number, but we need your number now more than ever. I promise you, we won't bother you too much, but we want you, we wanna make sure that we can get you if so we can keep your child safe as well as everyone safe and so again, if you could please update your contact information. And again, the principal will make an appeal to you to get that done, but we need that information. Also, you will receive from principals releases for recordings because we're, we're in classrooms. So we want media releases from you so that if we're in classrooms or we're recording things that we can have your child's capture your child's photo or picture. And I wanna thank the families that allowed students to record with me last week. So I'm looking forward, we're going to push out our video, our school reopening video. So we're excited about that's in the process of being edited now. And so we thank you again. Again, we won't take your kids pictures and do anything that's inappropriate, but as I mentioned in my earlier comments and throughout the time I've been serving as your superintendent, it's so vitally important that we keep our students at the core. 
them being the first in our work and what we do. And so that's why we put students of our uh, pictures of our students everywhere, because it's really, they are the heartbeat. They're our heartbeats. This is why we're here. We are here for the benefit of them. So we want to get those pictures and show people how talented and sensational and beautiful they are and remind all the adults that it's really about them and their success. I believe that I was able to capture all the questions thus far as it relates that you have. Again, if you please look at the superintendent's page, every presentation uh, should be there. If not, I'll make sure that my team put, put the presentations up um, that we've made as it relates to everything that we've had, we've done. Um, we also will share again the guidance documents with you like so i want to we're in the process of just editing so we will get that document out before um the february 8th date so we'll send it electronically we'll put it we'll give it we'll have our principles and i'm not sure exactly how class tag works or how much data it can have because it'll be a thick document but if we can't share it with you via class tag it will be on our website we also will share it facebook and everywhere else so that we as a collective team, because it's really one Chester, one team work to keep all of our children safe. As I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, we're excited about um, reimagining our digital academy. And Dr. Barnett is coming with a presentation to give you a, an overview, because maybe some of the parents who selected one option may say, huh, maybe this is an option for my child. So Dr. Barnett is going to lead us through the next few minutes of our presentation. Dr. Barnett. Thank you, Dr. Barks. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just want to make sure, first of all, that my volume is at a good level and everyone can hear me and that you can see my screen. Well, I want to welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, the pandemic has caused us to rethink what we do in many areas of our lives. And one of the things that we've done here as a district under Dr. Burke's leadership is to begin to reimagine and think about um, how could Digital Academy uh, be different? And so what I'm going to do with you tonight is just walk you through uh, two things. One is what does the Digital Academy look like now very quickly? And then what does the reimagining look like? You know, it's like redoing a house. Uh, you, you have those, um, I like HGTV and they always have the photographs of before and after. And if you miss the before, you really don't get to appreciate the after. So I want you to have just a sense of what it is like before. And it's a great product now that we offer students, but we're gonna take it to the next level. Our reimagining was certainly based around our core and the mission and vision of the district as a whole. But certainly what drove us was, first of all, we, we're gonna keep children first that we are one Chester Upland, that we're reimagining. And I have a slide a little bit later that really kind of defines and shapes our thinking about what reimagining is. And then equity, excellence, and emotional intelligence. We're one family building on the collective strengths of everyone in, within our community. And part of what we've done with the reimagining the Digital Academy, and it has a new name, but I'm saving that for the slide, is that we really ask the question, are we making this available to as many students who are in our district and even students who have chosen educational options uh, at other schools? charter schools, virtual charter schools, that they might decide to come back to the district knowing that our district is offering something similar. So just an overview of the Digital Academy very quickly. There are three components to the Digital Academy. We have fully blended online learning model. And that's really what tonight's presentation is gonna focus on. 
is the students that are fully, this is the instructional model that they use, is fully online blended with teacher supported, teacher facilitated instruction. Uh, currently it's for students who are in grades nine to 12 at Chester High School. And they, it's a blended program where they come in half a day and then they do half of their work at home. The other two components of Digital Academy that we won't talk about tonight, but that will remain in Digital Academy going forward are the online en enrichment advanced courses for students nine to 12 in Chester High School. And those are students who might need a pre-calculus course or they wanna take uh, Japanese, for example, and no one else is offering, they can do that in the Digital Academy. And then the final component of the Digital Academy is credit recovery, which is uh, both in year and summer. And our summer credit recovery, our SARA program, our summer academic recovery academy is for students in grades seven through 12. So just want to, I, I know it's uh, evening and I wanna kind of keep you engaged. So I'm gonna show just a little bit of a video and I'll stop. Uh, just to show you what the digital, the digital academy looks like in its current form. This was our year in review for last year. The curriculum, oops, I love technology when that happens. The curriculum that we use is uh, GradPoint. There are over 180 courses in GradPoint. This is a picture that you're seeing of the current digital lab and the students working. And what you will notice, you'll see some students working independently and some students working in small groups with the teacher. This is their holiday party. Lots of uh, things. They have a career day. We do a lot of work in Digital Academy of tying careers, the courses they're taking to the college and career choices of students. They were a school for Amazon and they did a coding course last year and all the students received certificates. I threw this in because life has changed the Zoom. These were our graduates last year. One of the students of the Digital Academy was one of the valedictorians of Chester High School last year. And this is a list of where all of the seniors except one went to uh, college. What is interesting about Digital Academy is that it's personalized learning. So you can meet a student where he or she is. The student that was the valedictorian was the student who did a year and a half of work in one year. Um, she because you're able to move at your own pace, she was able to get things done. So let's look at this idea. That's just an overview of the Digital Academy as it is now. Our students are still working at home, moving ahead and participating. We have an excellent staff uh, that support all of the students and we use what we call uh, our support uh, coordinators that handle the attendance, uh, social emotional support for students that will continue in the reimagining of the digital academy. So our question becomes what could and should the digital academy be in the future? So we're reimagining. And I love this slide because it just gets us to think about what reimagining is, you know, challenging the traditional, see it different, rethink, reconsider. And when you're reimagining, you're not starting from scratch. You want to keep what you have and maybe rearrange it, use it in a different way. So in our reimagining, we're keeping the excellent online curriculum, which is GradPoint. We're continuing our educational model and methodology of using competency-based and mastery-based model. And for the parents that are on tonight, let me just take a minute to explain what that is. Competency-based means we start where the student is. 
So if we get a student who is at a seventh grade reading level and the student is in ninth grade, we start and we close that gap by giving them, we kind of do it like this. So we're, we're moving from this point to this point, giving them materials that bring them together and get them on level so they can go ahead. Mastery means the grad point curriculum is they come to the material, the, the skill that is taught over and over again, it's circular. And every time they come to it, it's more in depth than the time before. So that allows a teacher to be able to look at curriculum and say, I'm gonna skip that section because I know Johnny already knows that. And that's the way the curriculum is set up that students do a pretest. And if they get a hundred on a pretest, they can then take the post test and go on. So unlike a traditional classroom, the student moves at his or her own pace. We actually have a video that's coming out with some interviews of students. And that's one of the things that the students say over and over again, is that they were able to move at their own pace. If they need to slow down, they can slow down. If, they need, if they're ready to go on, they can go on and they don't have to wait for everybody else. That's what this personalized learning is about. Flexibility in terms of their, they can do school at any time. They have, they have 24 hour access to curriculum and they can also access their curriculum on their phone on, online. We have incentives, excellent staff, connection to instruction of instruction to college and career goals and students are able and here's it. So if you hear of anybody saying that they're going to a virtual charter school, you tell them there's no need. You don't have to go to a virtual charter school. You can get exactly what you need right here in the Chester Upland School District. You know, and, and here's the plus. Now let me give you a plus because you got you, you know, you have to have a carrot because people say, well, they're going to give you a computer. So are we. Well, they're going to give you internet. So are we. And here's what we can give you that they can't give you. You can still participate in all of the activities that any other student and the Chester Upland School District does. So what does that mean? You don't have to go to the prom in Harrisburg or Reading or virtually. You can go to prom right in the community in which you live. You still have access to counselors, class trips, support services. So that's the plus. So you can get what other folks offer and get all of the support of any other student in the Chester Upland School District. Participate in choir, band, basketball, football, cheerleading, you name it, and still be able to uh, do school remotely online. So we're moving to what incorporating, so what's new? What's the re-imaging part? I've told you what we're keeping. And the re-imaging part is we are adding what is a design thinking instructional model. And some of you all say, wait a minute, well, my child doesn't want to be an engineer. Design thinking is not anything about being an engineer and architect. It's a way about thinking about learning. So I'm going to have just a little bit of an explanation by Marlon Lindsay of what it is. In common language, um... Design, the, our, our society is, is uh, engineered, built, um, and behind all of that is some thinking about how do we design, build, whether it's a house or a car. So design thinking is the thought process that goes into building anything, curriculum, uh, you name it. Uh, and there's a process for, for doing that, and there's a specific process that we uh, we use, which which Danny will will talk about, as we think about uh, design and thinking as it relates to STEM. We talk about empathy a lot, um, but really in design thinking, it's really practice empathy. You really do have to get inside the mind of um, the, the 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 subject that you're designing for, the client that you're designing for, the target that you're designing for, to understand how they're going to use, utilize, how it's going to improve their lives. What's their purpose for? this design. And when you understand that, you empathize with them and therefore you can create something that they can fully utilize. It, it's a, it's, it's almost a dynamic, um, 
experience of teaching and learning at the same time from the student and the teacher um, to echo that. In, in fact, uh, one student that we talked to and we were asking, well, what did you enjoy about this process? Um, he said, I, I, uh, it was really interesting and surprising to the superintendent and the teacher to hear this. He said, you know, um, I finally got a chance to use my brain. So he was engaged in the process creatively, not just having information supplied to him, but he was a part of creating that, uh, that experience and that information as they problem solved and, and engaged in the, that design thinking process. So when you think about design thinking, there are five steps to it. And what the um, EdTech uh, TED prep does for us is they provide us with courses that allow our students to engage in this design thinking. Uh, let me explain it this way. They, one of the projects that the students were asked to do is to design a book bag. And so to start off, the students design a book bag. And then when they go back, they said, but this, the person you're designing the book bag for is in a wheelchair. And so that's that empathy piece. So now all of a sudden, if I'm in a wheelchair, putting the book bag on my back doesn't make sense. So that's really getting students to think in a different way. And these are the skills that they need, these five skills to empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And they engaged in this process called uh, failing to succeed. So if you don't get it right the first time, then what did you learn? What do you need to do? How do you need to rethink it? And they have excellent courses, uh, everything from designing a building to music. So it's an incorporation of STEM and STEAM in these courses that students get to take and get engaged in this process. And the teachers think utilize this process as well in instruction and how they have conversation uh, with students. It is project and problem-based. It provides students with essential 21st century skills. Uh, it teaches them what they need to learn by doing. And um, again, it incorporates what we utilize in the grad point curriculum, uh, mastery-based learning, and they develop marketable skills and career readiness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. So there were act there are actual courses at both the middle school and high school level that the students will be able to engage in. Uh, so what we've done is we reimagined the curriculum by this marriage or adding tre tech trip to grad points. So students are not only getting this intellectual piece, they're also getting courses that they can take where the teachers and the students are engaged in course and designing projects going through the course that they can use. There are courses on financial management, uh, utilizing the soundboard uh, in making music. So there are things that students are interested in, but not only then, this, there's a writing component to it. So students are also learning how to communicate their ideas and present them as well. Okay, so I thought best way to explain something is to have young people tell you. This is from some students who are utilizing the design thinking approach and the courses offered by Tech Prep uh, in uh, Cottage Grove Upper Grade Center in Fort Heights, Illinois. So sit back and enjoy as students explain to us and talk about design thinking. We live in an age where it's exciting to be in education because there's a paradigm shift. No longer are students expected to just sit and open a book and work from a worksheet. 
We are expecting kids to do more hands-on activities, more collaboration, higher level critical thinking. And those opportunities allow them to build their own future. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Or you could say STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, and art, and mathematics. Currently, uh, with TechTrep, we have three grades with our younger, younger students are working on foundations of programming. Our seventh graders are working on web development, and our eighth graders are on financial literacy. When I thought of STEM, I always thought of robotics. Like, that was the first thing that came to my mind. The skills that I'm learning are how to make my own little video games. What I like about TechTrep is that the different sections that you have in each course. I'm taking an introduction to technology. I'm doing coding and I've been on a website. Intro web development. I feel like that. I want to just start coding like games and stuff. I'm developing my own website. I love like coding. I think it's cool. Because it was affordable and because it was scalable, we were able to bring the program into the district and implement it at all grade levels. I think my class has become more interesting. Uh, see more and more students are excited about coming to class. They ask about, you know, we're doing tech trip today. I would never thought I would like to do stuff like that in STEM or like the stuff I'm doing in tech trip. I thought it would be like dirty, but now since I really got into it, I really liked it. And I started putting effort into it. What I'm learning about myself is that I push myself so I can uh, succeed of what I'm trying to achieve. There was a time when I was like, I don't know about this technology, but my students are the ones who fueled my excitement about it. And for me to be able to learn from my students, that gives them a lot of confidence. Our mantra here is teamwork makes the dream work. And you hear the kids saying that, that they're not selfish in their learning. They want to share and they want to show the others and help others as well. From Tech Trap and my financial literacy course, I have learned about goal setting, how to save money and um, like spend wisely. And I just buy stuff that I don't need when I can save it for the future. And you would see kids getting frustrated or they would tell you about it. But what I always appreciated, the kids, they had the perseverance to keep going and to keep working at it and they didn't give up. They are tenacious. You learn from your own mistakes. You can do it better. If I mess up, I could try again and try again and I have more effort in me. Well, what I like about it is that everything that I imagine can come true. Only if I put my brain to the use of it. Uh, things that they didn't know that they could do before, what they're doing now. STEM got a lot of things you can do based on your personality. To get into STEM, it doesn't matter what's your race, your gender. If you're poor, you're rich, you just have to be open-minded. If you're not a fan of technology, just go to science. If you're not a fan of science, then go to mathematics. But for me, I like technology. I learned that I can evolve and get better. I didn't even know I was interested in this. So I never knew I was capable of doing stuff like this. We weren't expecting that level of excitement, and that's what caught fire. There's a lot of hidden talents. The unrealistic has become realistic for them to, this is something that they can achieve. When I grow up, I want to be a gamer. I want to be a pediatrician. I want to be a chef, a mathematics teacher. I plan on owning my own bakery, owning my own little business. I want to be an OBGYN. NFL player. I really want to be a STEM teacher and become a professor. If given the right opportunities and a chance, which is what Tech Trek offers them, the sky is the limit for them for a 21st century career. So this has been Dr. Burks uh, working uh, with me, but this has really been her vision. And I can tell you, she's really thinking about it, sort of was piloting, piloting it small, uh, also working with Chester High School and with Toby Farms. So in addition to digital, there will be uh, some other students will have access to the courses. And so when we were re-imaging this, what would it look like? We felt like, well, it needed a, a, a re-image name. 
So the name noun is the Design Thinking Digital Academy to separate it from just Digital Academy. And, and you have an understanding now of what this design thinking is all about. It's really preparing students to think in a way that will prepare them for college and careers uh, once they leave high school. There's our new name. So this is the mission of the Design Thinking Digital Academy. And this is a direct quote from Dr. Burks. The mission of Chester Upland School District Design Thinking Digital Academy is to provide a fun and engaging high quality online instructional academic program that leverages curriculum and resources and prepares students for college, career, and life beyond high school. So this slide here just shows you what, how we reimagine. So the first way we reimagine is we've in terms of equity, we've expanded the digital academy from only ninth to 12th grade students in Chester High School to now being open to any sixth through 12th grader uh, who's enrolled in the Chester Upland School District. Uh, if you looked at the survey results, there are the, the largest number of families that are interested in the digital academy are students of who are enrolled in middle school. So it was a good thing that uh, Dr. Burks had the vision for us to move in that direction because there is a population that's looking for that uh, alternative. Prior to the um, reimagining, we ended up with only part of the students could take course for the most part, students had to come to the digital lab to take courses. What we've learned from the pandemic is that there are some students who do very well uh, and they no longer have to go to a virtual charter school to be able to engage in schooling from home in a fully remote model. We will now be able to offer that. And so students will have a choice once we're fully uh, back into the building, we phased back in between whether or not they come into the digital lab or they're fully remote at home. There is an extensive college and career preparation piece to uh, the, the Design Thinking Digital Academy with internships, with uh, bringing in companies to evaluate the work of students, to really engage that partnership between students uh, involved in service and community and also being able to get real work, real life experiences while they're engaged in their study. And we do incentives now in the Digital Academy Student of the Month. Uh, they get a Student of the Year, they get a, a perfect attendance, they get incentives. But what we're going to do now is to make that a more formalized program so students know what that is coming in the door. And so if you want more information, there is a number for you to call or you can email me. We will have uh, within the next week or so a more formal uh, sort of information session, open house, if you will, for those families that want more information but in the interim, please feel free to call, email me, and uh, we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation as well. So with that, Dr. Burks, I hope that's uh, been an overview for everybody. Uh, I will open the floor for a few questions and conversation from the chat.
So I'm looking, Dr. Barnett, to see if we have any questions specific to digital cabinet. There are a few questions that uh, I will address uh, from our previous conversation prior to your presentation. We have in the chat, the video is amazing. Let's see. And there are no specific questions regarding Digital Academy at the moment. Oh, thank you, Dr. Burks. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. I wanna thank Dr. Barnett for her hard work in uh, helping to reimagine our Digital Academy. She had to talk with me very late nights and very early mornings and on weekends and everything so that we can design the curriculum and talk through what this program should look like. We've made an appeal to many of our stakeholders throughout our learning community. And so if this is an option, another option, because I believe in choice for families, for you and your child. And so please email Dr. Barnett to express your interest in the Digital Academy. And it's an exciting program. And we're excited, we're happy that we're able to partner with Tech Prep to make this program innovative for our learners. I like to, the few things I didn't mention, it's good to have a good team. So my team reminded me of this and I just make sure there's clarity of understanding. So our students, I wanna go back to the three options that family selected. And I saw in the chat, the family, a parent asked, was my child going to school or not? And so I wanna address that. We've asked families to express their intentions as it relates to which model that your child is selecting. So is it virtual, fully virtual, fully remote? One, hybrid, in which you go to school two days a week. So we have a cohort C, which is for Chester, that will meet a, what we call um, a Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday, all of our learners will learn uh, virtually at home. And then on Thursday and Friday, cohort U will come to school on those days based on social distancing guidelines in the effort to help combat and mitigate the spread because of space, we are having two cohorts. Your child may go to school on Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Friday. We've made attempts, and I'm not gonna say that it's done to a true science, so I'd, I'd like to be direct and transparent. We've asked our schools to try to group families together across the district. That is our request. So when you receive a letter from your school, from your school's principal saying, hi, your child's in group uh, C and school is at this time and these are the days, if something happens and if we can accommodate you, we will, we may not be able to account the, uh, accommodate the families depending on how many children you have and how the what classes are being offered, but we will try every attempt to make sure that we accommodate you. We also want to, I, again, I said that our, um, all, you'll receive all transportation information. Our target is for February 8th. Right now, we had asked, uh, initially we wanted our teachers to report to school on January 25th and teach from their classrooms. However, we ran into some connectivity bandwidth challenges throughout the district in which we're working to mitigate right now. And so our target right now is February 8th, but in the event, my team will have to tell me no later than Friday, will we make that February 8th date? So we will inform you families if we have to push back the reopening because what is happening is that when people are in district, then the connectivity is not there. So there could, uh, in some one school, I went to a school on Friday and there were three people and they were losing connectivity. So just imagine if we had 75 people in the school and we wanna make, we want to ensure that our students are able to learn from their teachers without interruptions. So right now, our targeted date is February 8th for students who are pre-K pre to two. And then our learners that are three, grade uh, three to 12, the targeted date is February 16th but I will send you a communication no later than Monday to, allow, uh, to inform you as to whether we are going to meet that target. And it will only be for connectivity reasons. The, I wanna answer more questions that were in the chat before we go, have dinner, because I know we're standing between food. 
And so, including Dr. Burks, it's hunger. There were a few more questions, so give me one moment. I wanna make sure I answer them. Will parents be notified if their child is on the list to return to in-person? Now families, and I need your help with this. If your cousin or someone did not take the survey, we are, we are making the assumption that you've elected virtual. We made many appeals. We thank our partners at the uh, housing authority who also assisted us with getting the survey out, all our families. I wanna give a special acknowledgement to the members of my superintendent's parent advisory council. Some of them sent me and said, I shared it three or four places. So I wanna thank you as well. So we tried to do everything we could. We put it in our meal bags to please take the survey. So when you picked up your meals from the district, there was a little note, we offered it in district if you didn't have a computer. So at this juncture, if you did not express your interest, we you've selected virtual because we are planning. So if your child again, if if you are a family who selected uh, hybrid, you will be notified. But again, the reason why we haven't sent you a communication about busing or anything like that is because we know as of today we're still having connectivity challenges. There was a question about ventilation. We conducted um, air quality studies. Uh, back this fall, and based on the study that was conducted, that our the our ventilation in our in our district was safe. We had a present um, presenters come in and share engineers come in and share with you the survey responses. We also included that on our website for your reading pleasure. And so, and if there are any other concerns, we're going to direct them to our director of facilities. So you, um, you should contact the principal. And the, and the principal will contact the director of facilities to help address the concerns that you may have. What is the, uh, can I watch this video at another time? Absolutely. Someone said they're just coming back, um, coming in from work. So welcome and thank you for joining. Yes, we will have this video available later. Will the kids have personal sanitizers? So we are not going to give the children personal sanitizers just for safety reasons. And maybe I'll let Dr. Marin address this because I want to make sure that we have a team approach and not just Dr. Burks talking or Nurse Lee. So if you could choose, please, Nurse Lee or Dr. Marin, whoever feels that they just want to jump in and talk about why we're not going to provide the students specifically with hand sanitizers. Sure, so the theory behind that in general is just um, so that we're able to observe the student in their use of using hand sanitizer. So if it's at a given location, it's in an area where we're able to have staff members um, observe the student in using it just to ensure that it's being properly used and that they're not ingesting it or wiping it near their eyes or anything like that. Thank you, Dr. Marin. Sure. I think I may have covered all the questions. So a family, a parent said, I didn't fill out the survey, but I emailed you, which I just received an email from Ms. Garner on Friday after my child's teacher called her. Okay, so if there's school specific things, please contact the school. So if you, um, we've asked our staff to call schools, so uh, call families, because we did not hear from you. And so please talk with your principal specifically, because we're empowering them to be the CEOs of their schools. So they need to tell we're supporting them, but we want them to make sure that they're planning and doing the scheduling and con and co communication with families. So for the mom who, who shared this, um, your concerns about in-person, please contact the school in question. And if you are not able to get an answer, please um, let me know and I'll look and see if you e when you emailed me. Okay. Everyone, someone said, when's the virtual start date? Well, the virtual start date, we are virtual now. We are all virtual. And so if you mean the Digital Academy, is that uh, just for clarity? Are you asking me about the Digital Academy? And I'm gonna let Dr. Um, yes, thank you. Dr. Barnett, can you talk about a start date for the design? Thinking. 
we're and we're working right now, Dr. Burks, to look at the start date to coincide when the students are coming back into the building uh, full time for through the phase uh, approach. So that will be contingent upon what happens with um, staff and students coming back with that day. So we're, we're looking at mid mid February. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. I hope that answers your question, Ms. Williams. Okay, so again, I think we covered every, thank you, you're welcome. We covered all the questions that were asked. And so you no, know, as educators, and I'm always, I'm a teacher first for any other role that I have, we learn by doing. The best learning that takes place is when you, you can learn the theory and we can tell you all these things, but we learn by doing. And that has more long-term effect and is more impactful. And so when we go into schools or we start school, there's some things that we're gonna learn. That's why we're phasing in. So we wanna learn from the population that we have now. There's some areas that we need to strengthen. I'm gonna be very honest with you. And we will continue to learn because we want to encourage a culture of continuous learning and continuous improvement at scale. So if you find that there's something that you don't understand, please contact your principal and if at your school. And if that your principal can't answer the question, you have all the members of my team who are here who have expertise in certain areas who will support you. I wanna thank Mr. Simonson who was able to be quiet tonight and that won't happen next time, who is our pandemic coordinator and he's also our health and safety coordinator. He also plays a very key role in making sure that he, we all follow the protocols. His charge is to research the best practices that are happening throughout the country and locally. His charge is also to inform our overlearning community. So on a weekly basis, he gives us updates on what he's learned. He also shares them with us. And then I share with our overall learning community. And so I wanna thank you, Mr. Simonson, um, publicly, because we've, we've tasked you in, with a big job. So we thank you so much for doing such an incredible job. I wanna thank again, our board members. Many of them are here this evening and I don't wanna make sure I don't miss anyone's name. So I, I just wanna thank them and it's board members appreciation month. So please give them a round of applause. January is board recognition month and they've been adopted by um, our schools to engage all year with, in various activities. So you will see board members at our schools throughout the district and, and supportive at school. So we're excited. And of course, we, can, we would be remiss if we didn't give another acknowledgement to the man, our receiver, Dr. Bond. So we thank you, Dr. Bond, for all your support as well. You're, and, you're welcome, Dr. Burks, and I, thank, and I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, I, I defer to you if you'd like to say any, um, address our families, the floor is open to you. No, I, I simply want to say thank you to you and your team. And I, I, and I look forward to the day that we can come together in person again and be safe with it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bond. I don't know if our president wants to say anything. And Dr. Burks, I want to personally thank you for all the hard work that you are doing um, throughout the district. You and your team, you guys have been working um, diligently day in and day out to uh, make sure we have a safe return for our kids and that they have the best learning community that they can have. So thank you so much and continue um, to put in the work and do the work. Um, and we really, really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. So I know, like I said, I don't want to mess up here. I know Mr. Jesus is on our, our team. Our board president Ms. Uh, is here, Mr. Johnson, Ms. Quayle. And I'm trying to look and see if I can scroll names. I think I, come on team, help me out because we don't want to forget the bosses. So did I get everyone? Okay, so I want to You're say- You're good, Dr. Burks. Yeah. Thanks, my boss came to the rescue <laughs> team. <laughs> I was scrolling feverishly. So thank you so much. And families, I thank you. I thank you for allowing us to serve you and your children. Um, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to help create a high performing district for our learners. 
we are fantastic. We are incredible. We are great. We are all those wonderful things. And what I've shared with my team, um, our administrative team, as well as our teachers and staff, we are lighthouses. We are beacons of light. Our children are looking to us for guidance. They're looking to us when the waves become real rocky and rough, when challenges come about. They're looking to us to keep, the, keep peace and calm and make provisions for them, expose them, appreciate them, affirm them, and show them love. And I wanna say, families, I thank you for allowing me to love your children. And, and thank you for joining this evening. And together, we will, our kids will get what they need. It's been a long time where they have not been able to learn with us in person. And as Dr. Vaughn said, we're looking forward to that day um, that we can embrace them, you know, and give them high fives and say, and even for our teachers and staff. And so again, I thank you. Have a fantastic evening and we're gonna continue to learn and grow together. Thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs>